Hello, and welcome back to Anti-Social Studies. Welcome to my ongoing series all about the AP History exam, specifically this new crazy 2020 exam. So today let's talk about using the documents. What does it mean to use the documents to support your argument, um, and how many points can you get out of it? So first, there's a lot of points to be had. This is the biggest category on the rubric, and that makes sense because it's a document-based question. But here's all the points that you can get. You get one point just for addressing two documents. That just means kind of describing a document accurately. We'll look at an example in a second. But you can get another point for using those same two documents to support an argument that you're making. Again, I'm going to show you examples in a second. Finally, you can get a third point if you use two more documents to support your argument for a total of four. So one of the things that I want you to notice is that anytime if, if it says you need, you need two documents to get credit, I highly suggest you actually use three documents. That way, if you mess one up, you're safe. Same thing, if you're going for this final, this third point where you're gonna have to use four documents, I highly recommend you actually just use all five. A lot of students ask if they can get points taken off if they mess up. No, right? There's nowhere in the rubric that where points can be deducted or taken away from you. Um, so let's say you have a really, really good essay, you're getting all these points, and then you totally screw up one of the documents and it makes no sense. That's fine. You don't lose the points you've already earned. You just don't get that point that you were going for when you address that document. That's why we say if you should at least be addressing three documents in your essay, um, three or really five, because that way, if you address three, one doesn't make any sense. You hopefully will still have two that will get you the point. Okay. Um, how should you approach the five documents? Uh, very carefully, <laughs> but also um, a lot of people ask, should I just skim everything? What should I read? In general, it's kind of up to you, but really you should make sure that you read fully the prompt and the sourcing information for each document. So what that means is the prompt, obviously, make sure that you read every single word because the DBQ is often a little bit more specific than other essay prompts. At least in world history, a lot of the LEQ prompts are relatively broad. They might talk about compare elements of state building in the world from 1200 to 1450, and it's relatively general. A DBQ is often more focused on a specific aspect. So a DBQ version of that question might be something like, evaluate the role of belief systems in state building from 1200 to 1450. And so you want to make sure that you don't skim the prompt, just see state building 1200 to 1450 and start writing. You want to make sure that you pay attention to the only thing you should be talking about is belief systems or whatever. The other thing you should read fully for each document is the sourcing information. So where it'll say like document one, and then it'll say like, this is a painting by this person, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's not very helpful, um, but sometimes they hide information in there that's really, really useful. So if they give you a document that they're like, I don't think there's any way kids are probably gonna just know what this document is talking about without any context, they will sometimes give you a little bit of information. So they might say a letter from this person to this person describing the condition of the native people of the Americas or something that gives you a little bit more insight and a hint into what the document's about. So read those two things completely. Then you wanna skim each of the five documents. Basically what you're doing in your first pass is if you're looking through, you're skimming through document one and let's say it's on that prompt about belief systems, you're looking until you find a keyword that relates to the prompt like the state or belief systems or religion or God or blessed or any word that kind of relates to those keywords from the prompt. Once you find that word, stop and read. Read everything around there um, to understand. You're sort of doing your own control F, right? Um, and so read that part in detail and make sure that you really understand what the, prompt, what the document is saying and how it connects to the prompt. The other thing is if you get to a document and you're really confused and you can feel your brain melting and you're like, I don't understand what I just read, skip it. Just move on. You only need to address three documents to do really well on this DBQ, right? You can get a nine out of 10 and only address two documents. So again, ideally three. And so if you get to a document that you're like, this is going to take me forever to figure out what this guy's saying, skip it and move on. Obviously, you can't, you can't skip more than two documents, right? But you can skip one or two free and clear and not worry about it at all. Okay. What does it mean to address a document versus use a document? So to be clear, we want to be using a document. But what it looks like to address a document is basically
just describe it in your own words. So let's say you see this painting, right? I think we've all seen this painting probably a million times um, about kind of manifest destiny. And so a, a student addressing the document might say, this painting shows a woman flying westward, bringing telegraph wire to the native people in the West, settlers, trains, and other industries follow her. So yeah, it's clear you're like, sort of understanding the painting, like you're describing what you're seeing, you notice this is telegraph wire, you notice she's going westward, but like you haven't really given us anything new that that a, a random person off the street couldn't get from looking at this painting. Um, and so what that shows us is you're not really getting the real meaning of this document, right? The real meaning of this painting is like, it's not necessarily what was literally happening, it's what Americans believed was or should be happening, right? So this shows only just kind of a surface level understanding of the document. And so you're just sort of addressing it and just kind of describing it. Now, what it might look like to use this document would be to say something like, the United States in the mid 19th century believed they were bringing progress and civilization to the West through their industrial infrastructure like telegraphs and railroads. That shows that like, yeah, yeah, you see the lady floating through the picture or whatever, but you understand that really the point of this painting is that it's the American belief in Manifest Destiny, their belief that they're bringing all these positive things, they're bringing light to the West, you know, yada, yada, yada. That really shows that you're using a document to support a claim that you're making about history. Okay. Do you need to group the documents, right? So you're going to skim through and you're going to get, you know, three to five documents that you can use to address the prompt. Do you need to group them into categories? No, there's no point in the rubric for grouping, but like you should totally group the documents. And here's why. First, it just helps you. It really helps you organize your thoughts. It helps you stay on topic. Um, what often happens is students who just want to go like one by one and just say like, document one is this, and document one proves the prompt by showing us this new paragraph. Document two is this, blah, blah, blah. What ends up happening is those students often end up just addressing the document and not using it to support an argument. All they're doing is just sort of describing it and saying, so anyway, that relates to religion or whatever. When you group two documents together, you are kind of forced to find something that connects them. And often that becomes your argument. And so it just is a lot more natural to then stay on topic, make sure you're answering the prompt, but also tie those documents together and use them to support the argument that you're making. Uh, the other reason you should organize your documents is that it just makes your argument stronger. It makes your argument more nuanced, more sophisticated, and that all means complexity. And lastly, it's gonna make it a lot easier for you to potentially tie in some of these other points we're gonna talk about in the next few episodes, like outside evidence or HIP, like evaluating your document. If you don't really have a clear topic sentence, if you're just going document by document, it's a lot more awkward to figure out where to put in outside evidence, or it's a lot more awkward to figure out like what the point of view even matters if you don't have a topic sentence or some category that you're trying to prove. So that's why I still think you should group them. Um, in a five document DBQ, what this means is really probably just two body paragraphs, right? You're probably gonna have an intro that's your thesis, maybe context, and then you're just gonna have two body paragraphs where you discuss the three to five documents you're gonna address. Okay, let's look at what one of those body paragraphs might look like. So let's say we have this fictional prompt, evaluate the relative success of Andrew Jackson's presidency. And you come across these two documents that you wanna to group together. So you see this cartoon of, it's like a political cartoon, King Andrew the first, he's born to command, he's standing on the constitution. If you had time, if you're in US history, there's probably a lot of things that you would notice. Then you also see document B is a description of Jackson's inauguration where people are freaking out and super happy and super excited to be there. It says thousands of people without distinction or rank um, kind of amassed on the Capitol as he was inaugurated and they were silent and then just like erupted into applause. Basically, people without distinction or rank are very, very happy that Jackson's being elected. Okay, and let's say you found some connection between these two and you thought, oh, that's interesting. Like some people think he's like an absolute monarch, but some people are like so happy that he's in power. That's again, sort of a complex argument to connect those two documents together. So what your body paragraph might look like is this. Hello, a lot of words. Let me hide my face so you can read my paragraph. You might say something like, this is your topic sentence, right? 
uh, you would say Jackson's presidency represented a win for the common man who had been cut off from power for decades. So that's now your topic sentence. And that's sort of your category that you're going to group these two documents into. So then you say Jackson's win in 1828 was met with popular enthusiasm as crowds of middle and lower class citizens celebrated. They were excited to see a frontiersman from Tennessee, a commoner like them, and the White House. Document B. I want you to notice something. I didn't quote from the document. I didn't just describe. I never even mentioned Margaret Smith. I didn't say like in this probably diary entry, Margaret describes blah, blah, blah. I just take what I need from this document and apply it to my argument, which is that it, he represented like a win for the common man. And I'm just putting it into my own words. Then I move on. This same success, that is a good connection to make, right? If you're drawing connections between documents, that's another thing that gets you kind of on the road to complexity. This same success was also met with contempt by traditional elites and conservatives who saw Jackson as a monarch, often making decisions in his own or his constituents' interests, regardless of their legality, right? He's walking all over the Constitution, document A. Again, notice, I never said the word cartoon. I didn't describe that, oh, they saw him as a monarch. We know that because he's wearing a crown and holding a scepter. You don't have to describe the document. You can work under the assumption that the people grading and reading your essay know these documents. They know what cartoon you're referring to. They just want you to extract the information from this cartoon that helps prove your point. Right. So this is an example of how we might group two documents together into one body paragraph. Um, and again, this argument is not on its own complex, but when you group the documents together and you start making connections and saying these two documents show us kind of two sides of the same coin or this document refutes or goes against this other document, those sorts of things, that's what they really mean by complexity. And that's what they're really looking for in a lot of those higher level points, which we're going to start talking about soon. So Next episode, we are going to talk about how to evaluate those documents. So the documents that we just used uh, for our argument, you can get some extra points if you also evaluate the source. So you talk about the historical context, intended audience, purpose, or point of view, and then connect it back to your argument. So that will be our next episode. So join us again. Make sure that you're subscribing to my YouTube channel. Make sure that you're following me on Instagram at Antisocial Studies, and I'll see you soon.